event of 40 days of Jesus showing himself. It, it, it's, it amazes me that people still attempt to argue the veracity. That's a, it's a hundred dollar word for the truthfulness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is by far the most authenticated eyewitness event in the history of humankind. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he was seen not only by the 12, certainly the women. I, I love that in, in this day and time, particularly in the last 100 years where we've seen the elevation in our culture of, of, of women to no longer be property the way they were referred to in ancient cultures but were literally seen as an equal alongside a husband, a wife. And Jesus came to lift up and elevate. And I, I think that it's not a coincidence that the women were the last ones at the cross. The men had gone home. The women were the first ones at the tomb. The women were the first ones to carry the message that he was alive, to go back and tell the men a woman was the first one who was entrusted to carry the gospel, and it's the mother of Jesus, carried it nine months. And when you see all over Scripture how God utilized, and especially in a time of, of revival, and I believe that uh, I believe the world, I believe that our nation is at the cusp. I believe that there are pockets of revival that are breaking out all over. I believe that the Spirit of God is like Genesis 1, is moving and brooding over the, the disorder and the chaos of our culture and our life, our lives, plural. And if we will just hearken, if we'll just listen here, because it's always you see the Spirit and the spoken word. In Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moves and prepares, and then God said, like be. And so I, I sense a movement, I sense a drawing of the Holy Spirit in our nation, and I, in spite of the completely ridiculous polarization of tribes, political tribal, tribalization, religious infighting, and all of those kinds of things, I have hope, I have hope because Jesus showed himself for 40 days. It wasn't just a quick, hey, how you doing, I'm out of here, but he walked around, he ate with them, he spoke the word of the Lord, he showed them what a resurrected body looked like. And then 40 days later he ascended and he still told them to hang on until the promise of the Father came and that was another 10 days tarrying in a room, an upper room in prayer and then God poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The church was born. That year, it just happens to hit the weekend this year, I'm sorry, this year of Memorial Day weekend. We're going to have a picnic. So we're going to have a great big birthday cake, not for Victory Church, but for the Church of Jesus Christ. That was the, that's our birthday. Come on, somebody. And so we're excited to bring this message to you this morning in the light of what we just celebrated, in that Jesus is alive the tomb is empty and the throne is filled. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe that. I am just foolish enough to believe that God is a good God. He's a great God. His word is true. His word has integrity. God has character. And he's not playing. Everybody say, he ain't playing. And so this morning we're in number six of this series called Signs. Dunamis, we get our English word dynamite from it. Uh, the Greek word dunamis means power and it's an expression of uh, the, the might or the power of God. In all the Gospels, when we see a miraculous event, a supernatural, something that exceeds natural law, a miracle takes place and we see a demonstration of dunamis or dunamis, however you pronounce it, and both are correct. One's a verb, one's a noun. Um, when John took it upon himself to show who Jesus was in his gospel, it was unique from the other three. He chose seven specific miracles, seven sign miracles, and he, it's the Greek word samion, which means a signpost pointing to something greater than the event itself. You 
don't pull over at the erected billboard that says Cracker Barrel and wait for a waitress to come take your order. The sign points you to the building that's on the service road down the highway, down the interstate. And the sign is to notify you of what's available, what's coming. When John uses these signs, he is demonstrating to the people of God that Jesus is not just a prophet, he's not just a healer, but he is the Son of God, and he is God the Son. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so in his divinity, in his complete humanity, all of those things blended together in one, he became the sin bearer for the sins of the world. He is the Savior of the world, 1 John says. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Today we're at sign number six. I think it's interesting that the very first miracle recorded in Jesus' ministry is the one that John started with, and it's where he turned the water into wine. And I want you to think about this. If if there is any kind of a Pharisee in you, if you're a little more churchy than you ought to be, then this has the potential to offend you. And I regularly say things like this, just trying to pull that mess out, because we don't want that. We do not want to be. I think the reason the culture's in the shape it's in is because the church has in the shape it's in. I think that if we cannot just be Bible-waving, angry Christians, but we can be full of the Word, but our first foot forward has to be love and not judgmentalism. Come on, somebody. Over all the hot-button issues, because you know what? Jesus loves all of those people. Jesus loves the people we disagree with. Jesus loves your enemies. You know, these are parts of the red letters that we've forgotten in the evangelical church in America that we're supposed to pray for our enemy. Yeah, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray God busts their teeth. I'm going to pray God kicks them in the mm mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you can go ahead and pray like that, but you're not, you don't realize what spirit you're of. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't bring correction or adjustment when it needs to happen, but far too often we lead, we want to speak truth, but there ain't no love to it. And we don't just need to be kind, because kindness without truth is manipulation. Truth without kindness is just plain hostility. And we've had enough of that. We've had centuries of that. We've had religious infighting with that kind of a spirit. We've had folk rise up in a political tribe and and marry their understanding of the gospel together. And we, forgive me, I don't want to offend you, but this is a Bible word. We ended up with a bastardized version of the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is free from either political party, and we have a two-party system in America, but it should be independent and stand and prophetically declare the word of the Lord into both of those sides. Come on, somebody, help me. Put your hands together. And so this morning, I'm not interested in tribalism. I'm not interested in denominationalism. I'm not interested in, in pulling over into a corner and thinking that we're the only ones that are right, because that's just pure foolishness. Help me, somebody, and say amen. So this morning, we are looking at number six, the sixth Samion, the sixth sign miracle, the sixth signpost pointing to something greater than the event itself. And my text is two verses in John chapter 9, beginning this morning. I'm reading from the NLT, the New Living Translation. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Everybody say from birth. That's important, okay? Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? And this is just a question that frustrates me. And I want to speak to that this morning. I don't want to jump ahead and, and, and reveal the punchline too quickly, but this is where the church is hanging out of so so many times. They're hanging out at this kind of a mentality. And the problems that people are currently facing, well, you must have done something. You must have made a bad choice. Well, it must be your parents. And and this is not just religious churchy leaders, but these are Jesus' disciples who've been schooled in this kind of legalistic thinking. 
And it says, was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? And so this morning, I want to try my best to speak to that question and how we can be a better representation of Christ's ambassadors to the Delta, to the community around us, to our schools, to our jobs, to our families, in that we would be a people who would live and breathe and declare Christ's love and the truth of the gospel, both at the same time. One thing, this is what I use as a little tool, if you don't get anything else, this will be repeated through the message. Religion, and I use this word advisedly because anytime Jesus used the word religion, it was not a positive thing, okay? Uh, and, and religion has done tremendous things for the world. If it were not for religion, you wouldn't have the half the hospitals you have because they're the Baptist hospital and the Methodist hospital and the Catholic hospital and the Jewish hospital and the Presbyterian. Are you following me this morning? And most of the real causes that deal with human rights issues have been born out of somebody that had a spiritual conviction based on the gospel. Even the Civil War itself was motivated by preachers that were preaching that there is freedom and liberty in Jesus Christ. When I'm talking about the abolition of slavery and recognizing the dignity that is in every human being. And they taught us to sing it in Sunday school, red and yellow, black and white. All are precious in his sight. And I remember as a nine-year-old going to a church, taught that, and we left Sunday school, just sang it, and we went into service, and a black family visited, and one of the deacons asked them to leave. And it broke my heart as a nine, ten-year-old kid. I said, this is not right. Why do we sing it? Everybody's precious, but then we can't worship together. And so I've been a little bit of a rebel from the beginning and not afraid to speak truth to power especially in the church situation. And we ended up leaving that church because of that. So when I talk about religion, I'm talking about intense rule-keeping that is without a heart. Okay? This is my one thing. Religion is hard and rigid, always appealing to the letter of the law. Relationship is what Jesus is about. So many times he, he came to... The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you, you have said, it is written in the law. And he would say, but I say. And it, was all, it would always be something that would supersede. It would be greater in the sense of demand. And it was because it was going to take the work and the power of the Holy Spirit and the individual's life for that to be fulfilled. Because I'm going to tell you, we can do all the externals, we can look good, we can be at church every Sunday, and we can have our kids spit-shined, and we can sit up and look good in our homes, our hearts, our finances, our relationships, our marriages. The relationship with our children can be a brewing, boiling mix of just a cauldron of sewage. Forgive me for the disgusting description, but far too often religion teaches us how to look good on the outside and it's never dealt with the heart matter on the inside. Religion is hard and rigid, always appealing to the letter of the law, but relationship, which is God, what God is about. He wants to know us. He wants us to know Him. And relationship is soft and flexible and is always appealing to the spirit of grace. And grace is not an excuse to get away with it. Grace is the empowerment of God's presence so that I can do what God's asked me to do. Paul said, by His grace I am what I am. Grace is not just a big blanket that covers my sin. The Bible says that the, that the grace of God has appeared to all men and teaches us to deny ungodliness. It shows us God's salvation and it teaches us to deny ungodliness and say no to worldly lust. Grace is an empowering presence of God's Holy Spirit in my life. And so this morning, religion, and you know what? It can be a denominational expression of it. It can be a Christian or a Jewish or a Muslim or, or any other religious De declaration of a rule or a law and far too often it ends up binding people instead of setting them free come on put your hands together religion is hard and rigid always appealing to the letter of the law but relationship do you know Jesus I, I, I don't care 
all the boxes that you've checked to make yourself look good externally. I want to know, how's your heart with God? Does, is, is he, does he have room? Is there space? Have you made room for Jesus, for the work of the Holy Spirit to be moving in your life, in your family, in, in your marriage, in your children, on your job? Relationship is soft and flexible, always appealing to the spirit of grace. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, this morning for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we need you. I need you this morning more than I ever have before in my life. And I look to you and I ask you today, I acknowledge before these people that I know that I am nothing apart from you. I can do nothing, Lord, except by your strength, but I'm thankful that I'm no longer in that position of being apart from you, but now I'm united. I can do all things through the one who gives me strength. Christ lives in me, the hope of glory. God, I thank you for that testimony of every believer in this room this morning. And for those today, Father, that you've drawn by your spirit and brought them to this room to hear and encounter and experience the loving, convicting, comforting, and challenging presence of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit in this room. We thank you today that only you can do what only you can do. Take my words, prepare our hearts. Let the gospel penetrate every soul, every heart in this room today and those listening over the streaming service and online at another time. Lord, let the gospel do what only it can do. We'll be careful to give you praise. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that we ask these things and all of God's people said. Point number one, we're talking about a blind man born that way from birth. And religious people are asking the question, why is it this way? Why did this happen? Is it because of his sins? Well, if he was born blind from birth, he didn't have a chance to sin an act, though I, we do believe at victory in the doctrine of original sin, because Adam is the federal head of one human race, that is every tribe and tongue, every color, but one human race, and because of Adam's race and Adam's sin, it has been passed down to us. It is in our DNA. But I'm thankful, yes, I can say I was born that way, but I'm thankful that now in Christ I am the part of a new creation race of which Jesus was the prototype. He was the firstborn from among the dead. And so now, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. One newer translation says, the old is gone, the new is come. Everybody say, how many thankful for the new? Come on, somebody say amen. And so this morning, I want to do what Jesus did. Point number one, I want to look through Jesus' eyes. John chapter 3, I'm sorry, John chapter 9, verses 3 through 7 say this. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus said. So let's deal with this on the front end. This is the, the overwhelming theological discussion and the argument in the whole book of Job. Go back to the, flip open the middle of your Bible and it will probably land in Psalms, which is interesting because it's the very heart of the Bible. Psalms is the heart of the book of God, the word of God, and Psalms is all about worship. So there should be worship in our hearts, in the center of our lives, just like there is worship in the center of God's word but you back up in front of Psalms, then you will see Job. And Job was a contemporary of Abraham. So we actually moved the book all the way back chronologically to the book of Genesis, chapter 11, 12, through about 22, 3, 4 in there until Abraham passes. And so we're talking about the founding of the Jewish nation, Hebrew people, and Job was a contemporary of Abraham, and he's just tootling along one day. He's one of the richest men in the east, and all of a sudden, lightning strikes and a hailstorm hits and all of his sheep and his livestock die and his children are killed and he's struck with boils all over him. And you know the story, his wife basically says, why do you keep putting your trust in God? Why don't you just curse God and die? And of course, we refer to Job's three friends as Job's comforters because they came to talk to him and one of them was 
speaking particularly from a moralist position, well, Job, you know, you must have done something wrong for this to be happening in your life. And finally, God wraps the whole book up at the end, and he says, shut up, all of you. Where were you when I scooped out the ocean? Where were you? And he, he gives all these descriptions of creation and how God holds all these things together. And the beauty of the book of Job is that God restores everything Job lost and actually gives him a double portion. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Let me just tell you that if you're in a hard time right now, if you feel like you're fellowshipping some of Job's sufferings, just don't quit because it ain't over till it's over. Come on, somebody. And if you can keep your trust in God, the pain you're going through, the words you got that was disappointing, the circumstances that you're facing right now, I'm telling you, God can turn it around and He can bring a double portion of His blessing into your life, into your children, into your finances. It breaks my heart when I hear some religious psycho tell some family because they have a child that was born autistic or a child that was born blind or deaf or with any kind of challenge or a disability that they did something wrong or they didn't have enough faith. And I get angry. I just want to I hurt somebody. And then I have to back up and go, Jesus, you're going to have to help me because some of these folk you telling me to love ain't got no lovability about them. In the church, we've shot ourselves in the foot when we're sitting with people that are broken because of circumstances that have played out the way they have and that we want to get moralistic with them. Come on, Jesus starts off by saying it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins. It is not your fault. Some of you are sitting in this room this morning and you had an, a, a, a situation that happened in your life, a traumatic experience, and you were the victim of somebody else's choice. It is not your fault. It is not your fault. God was not angry with you. God did not put that on you. We have a very real enemy in our lives who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then, verse 6, I love, I love this. God, I'm so thankful that this verse is in the Bible. Then he spit on the ground. That's just not very majestic, is it? I mean, it's just not kingly. It's just not, Jesus didn't wave his hand and then the sight appeared in the eyes of the man. Jesus, <laughs> gather up some dirt, <laughs> and he makes a mud paste. I don't know about you, but the last time I played mud pies, I was about four years old. The Savior of the world, the creator of every living thing, stooped down and gathered some dust and he spat in it. First of all, those are two things that the law of Moses tells you if you're a good Jew, you don't have anything to do with. If someone spits on someone else, it's considered to be extremely offensive because it's dirty. They didn't understand germs yet, but they recognized that there was something that was moving from one person to another that was contaminated. And they didn't even know that word yet. We didn't, have, we didn't even learn about germ theory until the late 1800s when a Christian man by the name of Joseph Lister, who invented Listerine, was trying to find out why when he was actually cutting people open in surgery that most of them died. And he went back and he prayed and God showed him the book of Leviticus about laws of cleanliness. And he started and actually developed an antiseptic to clean his tools and wash his hands. And it was amazing in the surgeries that he was doing that the, the morbidity, the mortality rates of people that he would remove a cancerous organ from all of a sudden shot up and they lived and they got better and they, they had health again because he went to the Bible and the Word of God revealed a secret that man never knew before that point. But good Jews knew that you don't spit on people. And you sure don't spit in the dirt and mix up a mud pie and pack it on a blind man's eyes. What is this crazy Jesus doing? 
Why didn't he just speak the word? Why didn't he maybe even come up and just, just touch the blind man's forehead and put his fingers on his eyes and say, open. Now Jesus did something that was offensive to religious people. I love that. Because when any of us thinks we've got all of our I's dotted and our T's crossed and we've checked all of our boxes of legalism, Jesus will always show up and spit in some dirt and rub it in your eye. I'm not being spiteful because I see this spirit come on me sometimes. And I have to go, God, give me fresh eyes. Let me see. He spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva and he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and he came back seeing. Hallelujah. Now he's blind. He's caked up with an inch thick of mud and somebody's going to have to lead him down to wherever Siloam is. And he's going to have to get down on his knees and he's going to have to throw some water in and he starts to, oh, there's a little bit of light. Oh my God, help me. Oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. And, and he's throwing water and all of a sudden his vision begins to gradually get more and more clear. And, uh, and, he, and he's screaming and shouting because the man who is blind from birth, who's never seen light, who's never seen green grass and blue skies and smiling faces, he gets up and he says, I don't know who this man is. I know that I once was blind, but now I see. Why am I preaching this series at Victory? Because I believe that the Spirit of God is moving over our region in the Delta to draw us to trust God because the Scripture still says it's not on a time. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't time out. It didn't expire. It's not like these... these these things that I get in the email, that if you'll use this coupon in the next 24 hours, then you can get this 40% discount on this site where you can order this particular kind of clothes or, or shoes or whatever. It didn't time out. Jesus didn't say, you know, for the next 40 years, this generation, to him and that believe, all things are possible. How many know there's no expiration date on that promise? How many of you know that that promise will work for you if you'll trust God? To him that believes, ever say, I believe. All things are possible. Why? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. My sin causes suffering. Y'all get anything out of this? I get a little bit excitement with my glasses, I guess. My sin causes suffering, but what I'm suffering isn't necessarily caused by my specific sin. I stood in my backyard, and I'll just confess to you, I'm, I try to be very real here at Victory. I stood in my backyard within a couple of days of losing my wife, and I shook my fist into the sky, and I said, damn you for doing this to me. Not only just the layer of grief of losing the love of my life, married 31 years, but the shame of being the preacher in town whose wife killed herself. And then the regret that I didn't see it coming, because we, we didn't, we all thought we'd turned a corner. She was seeing a therapist, she was under medication, we were praying, we were doing body, soul, and spirit, we were doing everything we knew how to do. And there was less than a handful of people who even knew what the battle we were in because there's such a stigma on mental illness and such a shame. And I stood in my backyard and I said, God, I didn't do anything to reap this crop. I don't understand this. Why? Too many times folk have tried this in the past because of depression or grave mental illness and the gun is jammed. Why did you let that bullet leave that chamber? Why, God? I can 
make choices that will mess me up and mess up my future and affect my family and affect everybody around me. But I, my older brother's wife died from lung cancer and she never smoked the first cigarette in her life. Why? She didn't do anything. Not around a family. It wasn't secondhand smoke. It just hit later in life. And boom, and of course now we've discovered a little bit regarding the genetic markers for those kinds of things. And the beauty of when we have a heart to seek knowledge with a godly motivation is that God can show us and reveal things to us. And I believe that there really are, there are great Christian research scientists that are seeking God for answers to solving the, the cancer problem and amazing things happening with immunotherapy right now where uh, there's a boost in your own system to, to beat back and destroy and kill those those murderous, rebellious cancer cells that are actually your own body that have turned on itself. We can make choices. I, I don't need to take time to multiply what any of those choices can be. Some of you are sitting here right now with the effects of decisions that you've made. But you know what? Let me just tell you right now, in the struggle that you're facing, failure is not final in the kingdom of God. But far too often, we want to put on our religious thinking caps and we want to point the finger and we want to go, was it his sins or his parents' sins? Or what decision did he make? Or what choice did she pursue? What did he do? Where did they go? What did they allow? What did they approve? And too many times, folk, we've got stuff happening in our lives that we truthfully... I mean, I remember the night I was in Memphis with a friend of mine over at... What is that that new, really cool outdoor place, Lofton Yards, over there in downtown. And, and all of a sudden, they're shutting everything down, and I pick up my phone, and, and there's some crazy person that's just going all over Memphis that's just shooting random people, killing them. Last night, 20 people injured at a Sweet 16 party down in Alabama. Six killed at Covenant Christian School in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. I didn't do anything to deserve that. It wasn't because any of those children's specific sin. Now, it is because there is sin in the world, okay? The principle of sin is moving in the world and motivating people, evil people especially. And I just want to say to you this morning that... Your sin, if you stay in it, it will cause you to suffer. But what you're going through right now isn't necessarily because of something that you have done. Somebody please say amen. I want to move on. Jesus chose two elements that the law spoke against. Because many times he will use things that we don't necessarily approve of to bring blessing into our life. So what? Think about this. Elijah the prophet is sitting out there by the brook Kareth and it dries up and he prays and God sends him meat hanging out the beak of a raven which is a dirty bird in the Jewish religion. You don't eat ravens. But yet God fed the prophet through the mouth of a dirty bird. How many of you know... You may be at a job where you don't agree with what's going on, but God may be feeding you and putting dinner on your table through the mouth of a dirty bird. Come on, somebody. Y'all getting anything out of this this morning? Jesus will offend your head in order to reveal your heart. He will do things sometimes just to get your attention, to say he's God and you're not. I'm, glad, I'm grateful he is and I'm not. Come on, somebody. Religion is hard and rigid and always appealing to the letter of the law. Relationship is soft and flexible, always appealing to the spirit of grace. I'm not going to take time. There's an extensive 35 verses in this middle section where he gets questioned several times. And he tells this story over and over and over again. Because basically the Pharisees are upset that this Jesus who has the power to heal is doing it on the Sabbath day. 
and they're always hung up about the Sabbath because, you know, the law says that no man is to do any work on the Sabbath. It is only for glorifying and worshiping God. And yet they take that thing to an extreme. And Jesus himself said, how many of you Pharisees and Sadducees, how many of you scribes and religious leaders who had an ox in a ditch wouldn't go get that ox out of the ditch because you care for that animal? And they just look at him. And he's trying to make a point. He literally says, you would get up and break this letter of the law to help out a hurting animal that's stuck in a ditch, but yet you don't want me to help a son of Abraham who is blind but now can see? Do you see what the letter of the law will do to you as a religious person when you've got to check all your boxes? Come on, somebody. And he says, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? And No, it just looks like him. It can't be him because he's blind. And he basically says, no, I'm, I'm the same one, the guy says, who healed you. What happened? He says, Jesus made mud. <laughs> I love it. Jesus made mud and he spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I see. And because it was on the Sabbath, Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. They're questioning him. They're upset. And I'll tell you why they're upset. Because Jesus got the power and they ain't got none. That's it right there. That's it right there. And they say, this man is not from God for he's working on the Sabbath. But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? And the scripture says, so there was a deep division of opinion among them. Some of them believed he was from God. Some of them believed he wasn't. And they're arguing about this whole Sabbath thing. Just the letter of the law. He says, they ask him, what's your opinion about him? And he says, I believe, I think he must be a prophet. And the Jewish leaders still refused to believe. And so they called his parents. It's a grown man. Grown man. Well, let me, let me, who your mom and daddy? Bring them over here. So they question the parents, and the parents are pretty smart. And they basically say, you know what, he's of age, let him speak for himself. And the scripture actually says, because they feared that if they declared that Jesus was the Messiah, that they would be cast out of the synagogue. And that's what religion will do to you. If you don't kowtow and say it like we say it, and believe it like we believe it, and act like we tell you to act, then guess what, we're going to kick you out of our elite little clique, our little group. Jesus said, you ain't got no time for that. You didn't know Jesus said that, did you? <laughs> he said, ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. And so they asked him. And so for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this Jesus, this man Jesus is a sinner. That's what the religious people were saying he says, I don't know whether he is a sinner. The man replied, he says, but I know this. Everybody say, I know this. He says, I was blind, but now I see. How many of you know, how many of you know, folk will argue until they're blue in the face about your politics. They will argue until, until there's no more daylight about your theology. But you know what they won't argue with? When you just simply say, I was Whatever it was, I was addicted to drugs and now I'm set free. I was bound in this destructive pattern of behavior and Jesus gave me liberty. I was, I don't know about this, but I'm telling you, I was blind, but now I see. Your testimony has more power to affect change in the delta than any of these other things that we want to argue about. Because when people see that your life has changed and the gospel actually has transformational power, then they begin to sit up and take notice. Real transformation will always bring examination. And so the man was kind of a little bit of a smart aleck. And he says, but what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? He said, look, the man claim I've told you once. Did you listen? Didn't you hear what I said? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Well, they got ticked off at that. <laughs> then they cursed him. Nothing like making some religious people mad. <laughs> and how many of you know? Look, you, 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 we, we church folk, but there ain't nobody in this room above letting one loose once in a while. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Oh, well, pastor, I never have. You know what? It'd do you good because then you'd learn some grace. 
I'm not advocating using bad words. Just don't get all so self-righteous because you don't use them, okay? Sometimes there's nothing better than they properly placed. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I got to say. I had a kid bully me the whole second grade, and I got tired of it one day because my mother always told me, son, you're a Christian, don't fight. Daddy said, pick up whatever you can and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> and I got tired, and I looked at this kid one day after school, coming home from Bragg down Reading, heading to South Center where we live, and I looked at him, and the kids were gathered around, and those knew there was about to be a confrontation. And I called his name. I said, David, I'm about to beat the hell out of you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Grabbed him by the neck, threw him down, and I jumped on him. <laughs> One move. WWF called me after that. <laughs> Sometimes all it takes is one move. I think I cracked a couple of ribs, but he never bothered me no more. <laughs> Ever since the world began, no one who's been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. And the, the, the religious people just can't get it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? We have theological degrees. And they threw him out of the synagogue. You know... I want to finish this quickly. When, when I meet Jesus, when I have any kind of an encounter with him, it's not just that a miracle takes place, but I've encountered something that changes my life. My identity changes. He's not a beggar anymore because he's not blind. And he's not, he won't be known as the blind man. They may still call him the man who used to be blind, but it's past tense. And that's what happens when Christ comes into your life. Everything before that, B.C., before Christ, is no longer an issue. Come on, somebody, and put your hands together. <laughs> the intimidation of rigid religion is all about dotting I's and crossing T's and a relationship with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus will feed a prophet through the mouth of a dirty bird. Or he will sit down and grab some dirt and spit in his hands and make mud and smear it in your eye. Just to see if you're going to get offended by the letter of the law. Or can you open your heart and let the spirit of this thing in. And let his power and his presence fill your heart and your life. And give you hope like you've never had before. If it weren't for Jesus, I wouldn't be alive today. I'm thankful that God has carried me. If it had not been for the Lord on my side... I just enjoyed my family in Fort Worth this week, my son and his wife and my two grandsons, Henry, who's three and a half, and Grady, named after my dad, who's six months old, and, and we memorialized Holly's dad, who died the first year of COVID, a famous Texas football coach. If you've ever seen the movie Friday Night Lights, that he was the coach at Odessa at Permian Panthers. Holly was the president of the student body. When you watch the movie... The coach was married to a teacher, and his daughter was the president of the student body. That's Holly, my daughter-in-law, in that movie. And she didn't play in the movie, but that part of the movie was about their life. The story from the book is actually an amalgamation of about four different coaches' lives all put together. And that portion was about Bruce and Donna Walsh and Holly, my, my Drew, my, my son's wife. And I gathered with them at the graveside where he'd, it was such a sad thing. This was 2020 December and Donna was on one floor with COVID and Coach was on the next and healthy 70-year-old man, not obese, no, no morbid conditions that would have caused him to die from COVID. Five days later, he was gone and we were praying and God, I just thought for sure he's going to come through. And lifting up Jesus, sharing the gospel, and I just remembered the heartache that Holly went through. They had to go down there to the hospital because they had all of the deceased in body bags in a cooling truck. And they had to claim the body. And it, they didn't allow it to be buried. It had to be cremated. And so we had the remains. And so we was there by the graveside and dug the hole. And we talked about Coach. And, and you know, not, not a perfect man. Some religious folk would get upset if, in the South because Coach loved to 
play the lottery. He would scratch off tickets and they'd make fun of him because they'd say, well, I saw Coach, he was down at 7-Eleven. And you know, they quit laughing when he scratched off $35,000 and paid his house off. <laughs> I better leave that alone because somebody's going to get offended. Isn't it crazy about the stuff we get all knocked out of shape about? Yeah. And you know what, if, if, it's, if it's a habit that you're gripped in and you can't quit gambling and it's stealing your joy in your life and robbing your assets, then yeah, that's something wrong with that. But, you know, having some kind of little entertainment, I don't, I, I, anyway, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but whatever. I'll probably get some emails this week, but I love you. <laughs> Let me finish this. Y'all get anything out of this this morning? I just want you to know that I, I, I don't want to be responsible for this message today because I flew in, my, my plane got delayed last night and I didn't lay down to one o'clock this morning. And we, we, we were delayed, delayed, delayed because of weather. And the plane was about half full flying back from DFW and landed about 11.15. Well, those last 15 minutes, I, I got reacquainted with prayer. Because we're coming in, and, and there's nobody between me and this really attractive 20-something Hispanic girl, beautiful young lady. And, um, and half the plane is empty. And all of a sudden, the, the plane did this. And she reached over and grabbed me. And it scared me. And I'm calling on the Lord, Jesus! <laughs> Not just from the plane, but from the woman that grabbed me. Woo! That's more excitement I've had in a few years, I'm telling you. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> oh, Jesus, have mercy. Help me. Let me finish this message and go home. We keep it real at Victory, okay? And, and so she finally let go, and then it did it again. And she grabbed my arm, so I just held my arm, arm out there so she wouldn't end up in my seat with me. I held my arm out, and she literally, I thought it was going to cut the circulation off. That little, just little, sweet little Hispanic gal was grabbing hold of me like this. And I said, it's okay, we're going to be all right. We're going to be, this plane's going to land, I promise you. And all over, I'm under my breath going, Jesus, please let this plane land. <laughs> <laughs> let me finish this. Last point, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered the world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees were standing nearby, heard him, and asked, Are you saying we're blind? Verse 41, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Wow. Wow. And, and, and what we hear is I, what we hear is I wrap this up. Musicians, come on back. Glenda, help me at the piano, please, ma'am. Is the paradox of spiritual blindness is that you think you understand something and, oh, man, I got this. And let me tell you, that's when you, you ain't got a clue. That's when I don't have a clue. It's like deception. Oh, I'm not deceived. Well, guess what? By the definition of what deception is, if you knew it, you wouldn't be deceived. So I always pray, God, open my eyes. Don't let me be deceived by a religious attitude or spirit or some churchy approach. Because I think sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot in the way we treat people that are hurting, that are broken. And you know what? Even if they did something that brought it on in that moment, that's not when we're supposed to go, na 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 na. We're to go, guess what? He's a Savior who forgives and who loves and who redeems. And by Him hanging on the cross and stretching out His arms and dying and saying, I love you this much, no. Man, no woman, no boy, no girl is so far from God that he cannot reach them. Come on. 
This is the glory of God in the Son of Man. And that while I am upset with someone, he loves that someone that I think I momentarily hate. That's why we cannot let ourselves get caught up in the, the political tribalism. Because Jesus is Lord over, he's not a Republican, he's not a Democrat, he's Lord in spite of all that mess. He's Lord no matter who's in the White House. Now, you, 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 you do your convictions, you, you go to the ballot box, you cast your vote, and please, my goodness, if you don't vote, don't complain because you don't have a voice. So, yes, do, do the thing. Let's, be, the, let's do, be good Americans. Let's be upright citizens. But in the end, I want you to remember your party affiliation is not a, an elephant, it's not a donkey, but it's a lamb. We're the party of the lamb, the lamb of God who took away... the sins of the world. I'm going to pray differently this morning than I normally do. Heads bowed, eyes closed, lights down. Open my eyes, Lord. Let me see hurting people in their brokenness without the religious dotting eyes and crossing T's. Let me see them with the love eyes of God. Jesus, open my eyes and let me see you Apart from all of the accoutrements, all of the trappings of just Christianity and the expectations of people, all the churchiness, Jesus, I want a relationship with you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Open my eyes. God, I finally ask you, open my eyes and let me see myself the way you see me. Thank you, Father, for love and acceptance. Forgive me for being my own worst critic, my own worst enemy. Father, I just pray that every voice listening, every ear listening under the sound of my voice, that you would let those words penetrate our hearts. Open our eyes, Lord. Let us see others like you do. Let us see you in a new way. And let us see ourselves the way you would have us to see ourselves. We're going to lift up a worship song as we close this service, and I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me. It's a wonderful song that very simply says, run to the Father. Run to the Father. Prayer teams, if you would go ahead and come this morning, not just the sides, but someone, if you would come to the middle, and I want everyone who has the desire, you can make where you're standing an altar can turn around and kneel right there and put your face down in that seat. You can come and kneel.